Hi. Very nice to meet you. Nice James. to meet you too. <laughs> I'm a histopathology registrar, I'm currently doing a PhD at the Institute of Cancer <coughs> Research and I'm also the chair of the Training Advisory Committee at the college currently. Right. Uh, well, I've been retired for 10 years <laughs> um, after a long career in histopathology, um, latterly as Professor of Pathology in Sheffield. Oh, wow. Um, but towards the end of my career I became president of the college. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and then I went back to Sheffield, served as Dean of the Faculty of Medicine for a year and then retired. Well, quite an amazing career. Uh, so James, could you tell me about what your early training in pathology actually involved? It was very different to how it is today. Mm -hmm. um, it was different in this respect. The training in pathology covered all disciplines. In mm -hmm. other words, as a trainee in pathology, I had to do, even though I'd made up my mind I wanted to do histopathology, yes. I had to spend six months in medical microbiology, oh, really? six months in hematology, Gosh. and so on, okay. through the major branches of pathology. Mm -hmm. um, and when we took the primary examination of membership, we took it in two subjects. Ah. So I had two practical exams, two essay papers, two vipers, um, in order to get the primary MRC path. Goodness. Whereas now I think it is single specialty training right from the start. That's right. You choose, you choose which one you want from the beginning, and yeah. that's the sole specialty you do. And the examinations are based solely on that particular specialty that you choose. And what was your sort of what was the day-to-day -day training like in histopathology at that time? I would say less structured, mm -hmm. less formal. Um, less objective oriented than it is today. Mm -hmm. I think what we have today, in fact what we've had since well, the last few decades has been a much stronger training program, mm -hmm. um, more prescribed, mm -hmm. um, whereas what I did was um, almost an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. We um, So when we enter histopathology again, the, being often very, most of the trainees are very naive to, and may not have had much experience to mm -hmm. it before. So the first year is a very, very steep learning curve, and we're often encouraged to learn about the normal, what the normal histology of a tissue looks like first. I think, I think the other thing I would like to say about um, the, my early years um, in research is um, my MD thesis. Oh, You're doing a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, it was very unusual for someone to do a PhD in my time as a mm. trainee. More often we did MDs, so oh, I nice. did an MD. And um, it was on the lymphocytic infiltrates in tumours. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was inspired to do that because when I was a trainee at Bath's, I went to a seminar given by Gordon Hamilton Fairley who is regarded as the father of clinical oncology. Ah, yeah. um, tragically, he was um, killed by an IRA bomb oh, no. that was intended for his next door neighbor. Oh, dear. Um, so he was a great loss to the profession. But he, he gave a seminar on tumor immunology, mm -hmm. which I found absolutely fascinating. Uh, that's one of the things that I love with pathology is those opportunities are very, there are lots of them available. So if you, certainly within my training program, if you've been interested in perhaps doing some teaching or research, you're very much able to be able to do that quite freely, um, providing you get to still see all the number of cases that are required and you mm -hmm. meet all the requirements of the curriculum, etc. You can go and explore those. So I was able to go and um, teach uh, several modules down in London, um, pathology-based modules, one day a week um, throughout my training. And then the opportunity came to, particularly because we're in an age now where molecular pathology is certainly mm -hmm. very much at the forefront of our minds in pathology, there was an opportunity to spend six months at the ICR learning about molecular pathology and the techniques involved. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for my future consultant career and um, applied for the post and was lucky enough to get it. It's been hugely valuable, particularly for the molecular side of things. Was there much, um, during your t um, time as a consultant, was there much interest in molecular pathology at all at that stage? There was increasing interest. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have to say that my specialty of histopathology was, I think, slow mm -hmm. to adopt molecular pathology mm -hmm. as, as, um, as a set of techniques, ideas, principles and research methods. Um, I 
I, I think there was a tendency to regard the microscope as being totemic mm -hmm. of histopathology. Mm -hmm. You know, it was yes. the thing, mm -hmm. it was emblematic, mm -hmm. it identified mm -hmm. the specialty. Mm -hmm. And anything that moved away from the microscope was something else. It was mm. chemical pathology, mm. perhaps, but mm. it wasn't histopathology. Yeah. And I deeply regret that. Mm. I think it's inter that's an interesting point, and I think that um, certain members of the, the, the generation who relied upon, who had the microscope as their sole sort of their tool, almost see molecular, it will be in certain surfaces, seen as a threat almost to that, to the security of that, really. Mm. But it's the, the way I view it is it's actually a jigs and one another jigsaw piece to help you on your path to a yes, diagnosis yes. and rather than something to replace it it's something you can use in addition to it really and I think that certainly from my experience with paediatric brain tumours there are tumours that can look very very similar to each other down the microscope and it's only when you can look now we've got the ability to go inside the cell go inside the nucleus and look at the DNA and the mutations and changes that occur in that DNA where we can actually separate those differences and look at two completely different tumours. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that that's really opened the window and opened our opportunity because up to that point, that, that child or that patient, those two patients may have been treated this exactly the same way, received mm -hmm. the same chemotherapy, etc. But actually, perhaps one of them needed a different type of treatment and we're now able to actually help tease that mm -hmm. apart. Yeah, well that's a, a very positive um, appraisal of, the role of molecular pathology. Um, I can remember when I came back to Sheffield after my year at the Institute of Cancer Research, um, I started doing gel electrophoresis oh. in the lab and Cephadex chromatography. Mm -hmm. And I think some of my colleagues thought I'd flipped, <laughs> you know, that I'd, I'd gone to the, to the dark side. <laughs> um, but to me, it was tissue pathology. Mm -hmm. You know, it was another way Absolutely. of looking at tissue. Absolutely. of extending the horizon of the specialty. Mm. And the very fact of molecular pathology, it's a, it's a different, it's a, we, have, mm. we, we should be leading that special, specialty. Uh, it, it, it's a striking contrast with haematology, mm -hmm. which embraced molecular pathology, molecular mm -hmm. methodology, mm. many, many years mm. before histopathology mm. began to. And I think and one of the reasons for that is that in haematology, it was, you'd often go into a haematology lab, and in addition to finding haematologists in a senior position in the lab, there would also be clinical scientists mm -hmm. in a senior position in the mm -hmm. lab. In other words, individuals who weren't medical graduates, they were mm -hmm. science graduates, mm -hmm. but they were bringing their skills in molecular technology mm -hmm. to study the blood and its diseases. Mm -hmm. You mentioned nicely about the, the clinical scientists, and that's um, certainly with biomedical scientists who we work with on a daily day, mm. daily basis in the lab. Things are very much changing in their in their roles now, and so we've seen over the years them participating more in cut up of preparing specimens, except doing the macroscopic assessments of specimens. And now even there are training programs for biomedical scientists if they wish to to perhaps specialise and take training in, say, GI pathology or gynae pathology to pass the exams and then be able to independently report those specimens. Mm -hmm. Did anything like that happen during your um, time? Did, it, was it anything began, starting to happen? Um, to, in the latter years of my career before I retired, um, you, you mentioned the word cut up, mm -hmm. the hyphenated word <laughs> cut up. And I, I always cringe when I hear that because it, it sounds so crude and I wish we could find some other way. A way that would, a, a word that would be more appealing Absolutely. to a young doctor. Maybe macroscopic assessment. Is Something better. like that. Better. Well, that's interesting because you say about the tools of the trade, the microscope, etc. But I wonder now, when we walk into a consultant's office now, instead of seeing the microscope, which is well still there, but there are also now computer screens, mm -hmm. and we're now very much in the age of digital pathology, where a lot of most of the departments are in the process around the country of actually converting to this now. Um, so instead of using the microscope, actually using digital images to make the assessment, and um, so they're, 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 again benefits of this are that you were, that there's been a lot of development and the college has been very heavily involved in this in trying to make sure that the software is up to scratch, the image quality is good as well um, and of course the costs involved are quite big for the departments but it also means that potentially mm. um, 
referring cases to another colleague who may be in a, perhaps another country across the world, maybe a lot quicker, where you can send a file to them to actually have a look at a set mm -hmm. of slides yes. and actually get a result back very quickly, rather than actually ses sending the actual slides and having to perhaps wait several weeks, perhaps even mm -hmm. over months, to yes. actually get the second opinion back. And of course, it's, it's easier, if you're working with digital images, it's also easier to demonstrate the morphological pathology mm. to, to a trainee Absolutely. or a medical student. Mm. Um, because if you have a medical student, you're doing microscopy, you see mm. something down your microscope that you want to show the medical Absolutely. student. If you only have a microscope, they then have to adjust the eyepieces, you know, get them the right distance apart, yeah. focus them and so on. And then in the process of doing that, they've knocked the slides <laughs> and the, yes. the, the, the feature that they were supposed to see is yes, no, longer. no longer there. Yeah. <laughs> but now, now with digital, with, with, with these slides being converted digitally, you're going to get bigger, potentially slide sets that are going to be available to a mm -hmm. wider number of trainees across the country and again internationally mm -hmm. as well. So yes. potentially it's going to have a real impact on um, on training and the, the exposure to different mm -hmm. perhaps rarities yes. that you may not have seen very much of in your institution where you're working as well. Another aspect of the resources that are available to medical students and, and trainees in terms of exposure to pathology is the Pathology Museum. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was at Barts, there was, and there still is, an amazing Pathology Museum. Oh, yeah. It is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it's unusual. Mm -hmm. It's unusual in that it still exists. Mm -hmm. In many medical schools, the, medical, the museum, if there was one, has disappeared. It's a crying shame, it really is. Now, some people attribute that to the so-called organ retention scandal on the Human Tissue Act. But it's nothing to do with that. Um, it's because these museums were relics. They were preserved as they always were. Mm. Instead of being dynamic, instead of being modernized to keep pace with mm. developments in medicine, there were vestiges of the time when the only way of preserving the image of a disease mm. was by fixing the organ mm, yeah. in formaldehyde yeah. and putting it in a bottle. Mm. Okay, so Shane, so if you, if, if you walk into a histopathology department today you gen and speak to any of the consultants, they generally specialise in perhaps one, maybe two, some maybe three at maximum specialties. Um, so it's become quite, quite specialised. Is that something that was the case in your during your Yes, um, I'm pleased to say it was developing at a rapid pace during my career. Mm -hmm. Just going back to the 1960s and early 1970s when I started in pathology, at that time um, there were many hospitals, district general hospitals mm -hmm. that were called then, that were staffed by a single-handed histopathologist. Mm -hmm. In fact, a single-handed pathologist in oh, some right. places. Um, one pathologist who covered chemical pathology, microbiology, hematology, wow. and histopathology. Gosh. Um, and once those people had retired and been replaced by single specialty pathologists, um, there were then many hospitals, smaller hospitals, that had just one histopathologist okay. um, who covered everything. Mm. Um, and that was unsafe. Mm. Because if they had a difficult case, there was no one to share no. the problem with. If they were on sick leave, um, who could they turn to mm. at short notice mm. to keep the mm. diagnostic service running? So the college did a lot of excellent work to expand the specialty of histopathology so that um, we were able to eliminate the single-handed histopathologist. Mm. And I'm pleased to say that was a success. Mm -hmm. That's right. We um, so normally, what again something that I found attractive about it is again having gone through medical school, enjoying all the specialties. What I love about pathology is you very much can explore those specialties still. Mm -hmm. As you say, surgery and medicine tend to pigeonhole you at quite an early stage into just one subspecialty, whereas the part, the final exam, the FRC Path mm -hmm. Part Two, you're covering all specialities within um, histopathology mm -hmm. and not just one or two. But we talked about specialization, and one of the drivers for that is the increasing complexity of disease classification. Mm. When I was a trainee, 
Do you know how many types of lymphoma there were? I don't know how many. Four. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> there was lymphosarcoma, reticulum cell sarcoma, giant follicular lymphoma, and Hodgkin's disease. Wow. And its subtypes, yeah. the subtypes of Hodgkin's disease were beginning to be recognized. Mm -hmm. Now, how many... Oh, I couldn't tell you a number, but there's infinitely more. It now. is yeah. many, many tens, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. 30 mm -hmm. different types mm -hmm. of lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with many diseases. Mm -hmm. the, and of course, the reason for that is that that very simple classification that we had in the 1960s and early 70s of lymphoma into just four categories wasn't sufficient to explain the wide range of behavior and responses to therapy. Mm. So it became necessary to subdivide those various categories mm. uh, and have a better understanding mm. of the cellular and molecular mm. phenotypes. But I think one of the other things that we're seeing introduced now is the sort of imaging-based post-mortems uh, or limited autopsies as well, where we're using either CT or MR imaging to actually scan um, a patient who's died to see if we can obtain a cause of death from the scan rather, and then avoid doing an autopsy mm -hmm. if, if, if you yes. can pick out yes. the cause those, of death. Those really. are very welcome developments. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, the autopsy rate in a teaching, certainly in a teaching hospital, it would typically be 50% mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. um, and invariably, the clinical team, the surgeon or physician, and their entourage mm -hmm. would turn up to mm -hmm. look at the autopsy findings. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if I did an autopsy and I didn't contact the physician and say, mm -hmm. I'm ready now to demonstrate the findings to you, if I didn't make that phone mm -hmm. call, there would be complaints. Mm -hmm. yes. it's, it's striking that the autopsy rate in um, neonatal and pediatric mm. medicine is still relatively high, mm. um, whereas in, in adult deaths, unless the death is referred to coroner, it's very unusual for an autopsy to be requested. No, indeed. Um, some people have attributed that to increasing public resistance to the autopsy. Mm. And there may well be mm. some increased resistance to the autopsy, but I, th I think it's, the decline is largely because relatives are rarely given the opportunity to give consent. Yes, no indeed. Um, the clinical workloads now, as in histopathology, are so great, mm. it is difficult, I think, for physicians and surgeons and their clinical teams to find the time um, to take relatives through what is inevitably a difficult discussion Absolutely. about autopsy. We're, we're reviewing deaths a lot more closely, so I think... Um, with the, the death certificates, etc., I think those, those processes are now um, very much more, well, rigid and in place. So those processes are present. I think we're going to see a big change now with the introduction of the National Medical mm -hmm. Examiners that is due to come in in April um, this year. And the college have worked extremely hard um, with this at the moment. A lot of work and investment has been going on, on into that. And pathologists, I would expect, um, the senior pathologists will be featured um, quite highly amongst the number of medical examiners. But the ability to be able to review each death certificate and each death that's happened um, is going to certainly hopefully restore a lot of the public mm -hmm. confidence in um, this process, Having uh, thinking about the effects of the Harold Shipman um, mm -hmm. situation. Yes. I think, um, and hopefully um, show pathologists in their light of how they can actually help and certainly being a port of call for families or um, of, the, of the deceased who want to know a bit more information about what's happened, what the process is. I think those are, those are important things that are going, we're going to see in the coming months. I wanted to also ask you, Sir James, that uh, I've been doing a bit of work to help promote independent reporting at the moment within trainees. So um, the, the, getting trainees up to the standard where they are competent to report specimens on their own, effectively things like appendix specimens or gallbladders. Um, and now we, we have an assessment process to allow that to happen. Um, but there's been some reticence from tr both trainees and from consultants in actually from both sides and actually signing trainees off to do that and also trainees being bold enough to put themselves forward to say, I think I'm, I feel like I'm ready for this. What was it like in, um, at your, in your training? Were well, you, was I'm, this sort of... I'm surprised and astonished. And I'm sorry to say a bit dismayed that that reticence still exists mm -hmm. because we were discussing that, I think, in the 1990s. Oh, wow. Um, about how to safely enable trainees to become 
professionally independent. It's such an important aspect mm. of training, mm. uh, developing confidence with safety mm. under supervision. Mm. So I, I, I do hope it can be expedited because it is such an important element of the training process. And I think, I think we could probably sit here until 10 o'clock with this discussion because everything you say seems to spark another thought in my <laughs> mind. Um, we've spoken a lot about trainees, you know, the distinction between trainees and consultants. But, you know, even until the last day of my professional life, I was a trainee. Mm -hmm. Every day, Absolutely. honestly, yeah. every day, mm -hmm. I was learning something new. Mm -hmm. Now, you may think that reflected my ignorance. You know, there was yeah. a vacuum to be filled. <laughs> but that was the thing that, one of the things that I found so enjoyable mm -hmm. about histopathology, that even things I've been looking at for a very long time mm -hmm. seem to have fresh messages for me. Mm -hmm. Just just going back to our career choices mm -hmm. of histopathology, what we have in common, mm -hmm. but a generation or two apart, <laughs> um, you're at the very early stage. Have you had any regrets? Not at all. I, I, I have never regretted my decision, although I, I really enjoyed the surgery, I've never regretted the decision to do pathology. And I love the ability of, um, you've, you're, you're a medical detective really, and you've got some, some information that you're provided by the clinicians, you've got your slides, you've got some potential stains, and now we've got molecular as well. And bringing those, all those things together to actually make a diagnosis, put together a report, and provide advice for the clinicians who are looking after that patient, I think is a, I feel very proud to be a part of that specialty and be involved in that. How about yourself? Do you I don't have any regrets, mm -hmm. none at all, apart from one, right. which I will come to. Um, I have no regrets. Um, I had a very enjoyable career, um, some wonderful colleagues, wonderful experiences. Mm -hmm. I was able to, I think, help many, many patients through my work as a pathologist. I hope I was able to um, discover a few new things. Mm -hmm. And I hope through my teaching, mm -hmm. I was able to stimulate and inspire and enthuse um, the next generation mm -hmm. in the same way that I was by Alfred Stansfield when I was a student. The only regret I have is something that you touched on. It's about the reaction to the word pathology. Mm -hmm. When people ask me what I did, and I usually start by saying I was in medicine, mm -hmm. because their immediate reaction is forensic pathology. Mm -hmm. Oh, you did that? No, it wasn't that at all. Mm -hmm. um, I was more concerned with the living than the dead. Mm -hmm. And even when I was concerned with the dead, I was trying to help the living, yeah, which is what absolutely. autopsies are, absolutely. are for. So my regret is, and I know the college is, has done, and is doing an awesome amount of good work in this area. My regret is that we haven't got as far as I hope we can mm. to transform the public's understanding of the role of pathology in medicine mm. um, so that students and trainees can feel even more proud mm. of what they're doing Absolutely. when they say, I'm a pathologist. Absolutely.